Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, uh, what's, what remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? And if you actually ask that question, but you have to want to know the answer, right? Because that's actually what asking the question means. It doesn't mean just mouthing the words. It means you have to decide that you want to know. You'll figure that's out so fast it'll make your hair curl. There's no better pathway to self-realization and the ennoblement of being than to posit the highest good that you can conceive of and commit yourself to it. And then you might also ask yourself, and this is definitely worth asking, is do you really have anything better to do? And if you don't, well, why would you do anything else? If you orient yourself properly and then pay attention to what you do every day, that works. And it, I actually think that that's in accordance with, with what we have come to understand about human perception because what happens is that the world shifts itself around your aim because you're a, you're a creature that has an aim you have to have an aim in order to do something you're an aiming creature you look at a point and you move towards it it's built right into you and so you have an aim well let's say your aim is the highest possible aim well then so that sets up the world around you it, it organizes all of your perceptions it organizes what you see and you don't see it organizes your emotions and your motivations so you organize yourself around that aim and then what happens is the day manifests itself as a set of challenges and problems and if you solve them properly then you stay on the pathway towards that aim and you can concentrate on the on the on the day and so that way you get to have your cake and eat it too because you can you can point into the distance the far distance and you can live in the day and it seems to me that that's that makes every moment of the day supercharged with meaning. That, that's how, because if everything that you're doing every day is related to the highest possible aim that you can conceptualize, well, that's the very definition of the meaning that would sustain you in your life. Well, and then the issue is, well, back to Noah. Well, all hell's about to break loose and chaos is coming. It's like when that's happening in your life, you might want to be doing something that you regard as truly worthwhile. Because that's what will keep you afloat when, when everything is flooded. And you don't want to wait until the flood comes to start doing that because if your ark's half built and you don't know how to captain it, the probability is very high that, that you'll drown. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That sounded pretty optimistic again. But, but, again, I think it's a description of the structure of existential reality, and, and by, by which I mean, when I'm in my clinical practice and I observe, and this is also the case with my students, is let's say, people's lives aren't what they would like them to be. And so then you ask, why? Well, forget about tragedy and catastrophe, because that's self-evident, and we're not going to discuss that. Although the degree to which you bring about your own tragedy is always indeterminate. But I would never say that every terrible thing that is visited on a person is something they deserved. I think that that's a very dangerous presupposition. Especially because everyone gets sick and everyone dies. But one of the main reasons that people don't get what they want is because they don't actually figure out what it is. And the probability that you're going to get what would be good for you, let's say, which would even be better than what you want, right? Because, you know, you might be wrong about what you want, easily. But maybe you could get what would really be good for you. Well, why don't you? Well, because you don't try. You don't think, okay, here's what I would like if I could have it. And, and I don't mean, I don't mean in a way that you manipulate the world to force it to deliver you goods for status or something like that. That isn't what I mean. I mean something like, imagine that you were taking care of yourself like you were someone you actually cared for. And then you thought, okay, I, I'm caring for this person. I would like things to go as well for them as possible. What would their life have to be like in order for that to be the case? Well, people don't do that. They don't sit down and think, all right, you know, let's, let's figure it out. You're, you've got a life. It's hard, obviously. It's like three years from now, you can have what you need. You've got to be careful about it. 
You can't have everything. You can have what would be good for you, but you have to figure out what it is, and then you have to aim at it. Well, my experience with people has been is, if they figure out what it is that would be good for them, and then they aim at it, then they get it. And it's strange because they don't necessarily, it's a strange thing, it's not quite that simple because you know, you may formulate an idea about what would be good for you and then you take 10 steps towards that and you find out that your formulation was a bit off and so you have to reformulate your goal. You know, you're, so you're kind of going like this as you move towards the goal. But a huge part of the reason that people fail is because they don't ever set up the criteria for success. And so since success is a very narrow line and very unlikely, the probability that you're going to stumble on it randomly is zero. And so there's a proposition here, and the proposition is, if you actually want something, you can have it. Now the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea, right? It's like, you don't get everything, obviously. You, obviously but maybe you can have what you need and maybe all you have to do to get it is ask but the asking isn't a whim or, or today's wish it's like you have to be deadly serious about it you have to think okay like I'm taking stock of myself and if I was going to live properly in the world and I was going to set myself up such that being would justify itself in my estimation, and, and I don't mean as a harsh judge, exactly what is it that I would aim at? And so the issue is not so much the blindness of others, even though there's as much blindness among others as there is, in, as there is for you. But the issue here, the advice here, the description here is, you should be concerned about what's interfering with your own vision first. And you should leave other people the hell alone in relationship to that. And so if your mode of being in the world is, if you would just act better, things would improve for me. Or if you identify the evil and the catastrophe as something that's outside, that someone else needs to fix or that someone's someone else is responsible for, then you're not going to fix that. And you're gonna remain blind to the things that you're doing and not doing that make things not go well. And so it's just better to think, all right, I'm probably blind in many, many ways. And maybe there are some ways that I could rectify that. Because it's highly probable that you're blind in all sorts of ways. I mean, it's, it's, in fact, it's virtually certain. And so it's just more useful to think, how is it that I'm wrong in this situation? There's this old idea that you go into the abyss. It's an idea that you can gaze into the abyss. You gaze long. And what you find in the abyss is a monster. That's the dragon at the bottom of the abyss, let's say. That's Satan himself, for that matter. But if you go into that, into that as deeply as you can, what you find is you find your fragmented father in a, in a comatose condition, in a desiccated and, and separated condition. And then you revivify that. Well, what does that mean? It means something. Well, it means that if you look in the darkness, you find the light. That's one thing it means. And that the light really stands out against the darkness, but that the light is to be found in the darkness. So that's a very interesting thing. That's a quest narrative. But it means more than that. It means something fundamental. So we know, for example, that if you take yourself out of your current state of predictability and safety, and you put yourself in a new situation, you'll learn, right? You'll incorporate new information. So that's a cognitive issue. But that isn't all that happens. What happens is that new genes turn on within you and code for the production of new proteins. And that happens neurologically. New parts of you turn on. And so the idea is that if you can move yourself out into the world and push yourself out against a maximum array of challenges, more and more of you turn on, turns on. And, to, and then the question would be, well, what would you be if all of you that could be turned on was turned on, and the answer would be, you would be the resurrection of the ancestral father. That's what you would be. And so that's why Christ says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the father except through me. What that means is that if you take on the unbearable burden of being,
being voluntarily, then that transforms you into the ancestral father. And that's true. And so that's unbelievably optimistic. It's so interesting because it's, it's dark beyond belief. Well, the world is characterized by suffering and by malevolence of a depth that's virtually beyond comprehension. But if you choose to comprehend that, what you discover in that is the light that destroys the darkness. And that's, well, that's, and that's really something to discover. It's, there isn't a discovery that's more profound than that. That's the search for the Holy Grail or the Philosopher's Stone, all of that. If you actually want something, you can have it. Now the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea, right? It's like, you don't get everything. Obviously, you, obviously. But maybe you can have what you need. And maybe all you have to do to get it is ask. But the asking isn't a whim or, or today's wish. It's like, you have to be deadly serious about it. You have to think, okay, like I'm taking stock of myself. And if I was going to live properly in the world and I was going to set myself up such that being would justify itself in my estimation, and, and I don't mean as a harsh judge, exactly what is it that I would aim at? You could try this. This is a form of prayer, knocking. Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, what remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? And if you actually ask that question, but you have to want to know the answer, right? Because that's actually what asking the question means. It doesn't mean just mouthing the words. It means you have to decide that you want to know. You'll figure that's out so fast it'll make your hair curl. You're perfectly capable of thinking. God only knows how. You're perfectly capable of of immense feats of imagination and, and dream and fantasy. It's God only knows how you do all of that. What would happen if you consulted yourself about the best possible outcome for you? You might get an answer. order for us to set things right, we have to understand that we, we have to take on that burden of ultimate responsibility. Not only as if it's ours, which it is, but as if there isn't anything better that we could do. And you have an ethical obligation to lift the heaviest load you can possibly conceive of. And that's the primary call to adventure in life. You need a meaning in your life to forestall the suffering and to make you strong enough to resist malevolence. Where's the meaning to be found? Rights, impulsive pleasure and happiness. No. Responsibility. Oh, who would have guessed that? It, it's not part of the narrative. What makes life worth living is to pick up, take its catastrophe and embrace it and carry it and to realize through that process who you are. When I talk to audiences about the relationship between responsibility and meaning, they inevitably go dead silent. There's not a, there's not a rustle, there's not a cough. It's like, is that the secret? Is that the secret? Is that it's the voluntary adoption of responsibility? It's like, well, that's the, that's the central message of the West. It's like to pick up your cross and bear it, you know? And everyone's been told that, but they don't know what it means because it's not been articulated enough so that it becomes something that's practical. It's like, yes, look at the terrible responsibilities you have right in front of you. 
your family is hurting, you're in trouble, there's problems in the world. It's like all of that's right there. And all you have to do is, all you have to do is take responsibility for it. And then you've got what you need. It's something so magnificent that happiness pales in comparison. And so it's, it's, it's thin gruel happiness. And young people know that. They're pursuing hedonistic pleasure. And you know, no wonder. But there's nothing in it that's sustaining. And all it does is make you cynical. It's like, is that all there is? Another one night stand? Another, another binge party? You know, and it's not like I have anything against, in principle, against some of that exuberant, youthful hedonism. Look, the universities have turned into places of parties. Why? Well, because that's what the students find best to do there. Well, that's not good. What you want to offer them is a reason to not party. It's like, no, you've got to understand. You come to this class hungover. You're not going to be able to get it. You're not going to be able to write properly. You're going to pay a price for that hedonism. It's like, and the price will be too high for you to bear. It's like, oh, well, enough hedonism for me then. Like, I've got something important to do. That's the way out of that. Before you can be a painter who can paint what's beyond mere memory, you, you have to inculcate that discipline skill. And a lot of that is painful repetition and hard grinding work. It's the sacrifice of the present for the future. But once you manage that, then things open up. That's why we have disciplines, right? I mean, the words aren't there by accident. You have to narrow yourself first, and then you can broaden outward. And so that's, and that's part of the process of maturation. That's part of the sacrifice of childhood. Say, in childhood, you're nothing but potential, but it's not realized and you don't know how to realize it. And so then the question is, well, how do you get to a point where you realize the potential? And the answer is, you sacrifice almost all of it to a single direction. And so that's the thing about growing up is that when you're a teenager and a young adult, you have to sacrifice everything you could have been as a child to be the one thing that you're aiming at. But then that opens up. Aimless is not nothing. Aimless is bad. Nietzsche said if you had a, a why, you could bear any how. Most people find the meaning in their life through responsibility. I believe the, the fundamental religious truth of the idea that life is suffering. It's suffering because we're mortal and fragile and because we're also subject to malevolence at our own hands and to the, at, at the hands of others. It's a, it's a constant existential problem. And that can make you bitter and can make you hopeless and nihilistic and depressed and anxious and, pro, and likely to abuse uh, substances of various sorts as, as a medication or an escape. It, it can auger you in, in, in a very large number of ways. And I'm suggesting to people that there is a way out of that and the way out is to confront that forthrightly and to adopt responsibility in your own life and to try to make the world a better place and that it's necessary to do that. And that if you don't do that, that things go badly. I think the deck is stacked against everyone to some degree because life is very difficult and we all die. So, but people, some people do have it harder than others. And, and all of us have it very hard at some times in our lives. It's like, well, what's the... What's the alternative? You take responsibility for that and try to struggle uphill because the alternative makes everything worse. Find something in your life that's so worthwhile doing that the fact that you're going to suffer is justifiable. Yeah, life's rough, no doubt about it. And if good luck comes your way, then you should be grateful for it. And if happiness manages to manifest itself, you should be grateful for that too. So then you might ask yourself, well, what's the best antidote to the discomfort of life and you might say well it's comfort and I suppose that's what you act out when you swaddle a baby but a better antidote is something like adventure to excellence and that's far better antidote to suffering than the mere absence of suffering so not to say that the mere absence of suffering that's not nothing I've been a psychotherapist for 20 years I've seen things you can't imagine horror shows that you can't fathom and people who have been hurt in so many ways so many dimensions it's like should they be bitter should they be resentful should they become violent these things don't help they have to struggle uphill despite their excess burden 
And it's, it's responsibility, not guilt. It's the female crucifixion. That's so, and, and that's exemplified best in, well, the best portrayal of that I've seen is Michelangelo's Pieta. You know, it's, it's a statue of Mary, uh, and she has Christ's body on her, as an adult, on her lap, and yep. he's broken and destroyed, and, you know, she's displaying that. And that's, that's the bravery of a mother to allow that to happen, but not only that, to, to facilitate it. Facilitate it. Where you go, kid. Where you go. Where you go. Well, why? It's dangerous out there. It's like, yeah, no kidding. It's more dangerous here if you stay with me by a lot. So you might lose your body out there in the world, but if you stay here, you lose your soul. You know, I mean, it's a pretty competitive world. There's lots of competition for young men in particular. There's competition for status and limited resources and for the attention of women. And just because you're nice doesn't necessarily mean that you come out particularly well in those competitions. I would like to say that you should all be smarter, but I don't know how you could be smarter. We don't know anything about how to improve intelligence, and I suppose we don't really know anything about how to improve industriousness either, but I can tell you that people who are industrious come up with a strategy for solving the problem that's ahead of them, and then they do whatever they can to stick to the strategy. And so, for example, if you sat down today or tomorrow for a couple of hours, three hours, and you filled in a Google Calendar, whatever you happen to use, with a, a strategy for studying, and a list of when all your assignments are due and all of that, and when you're going to sit down and study, then you won't be in a position where you have to cram for 10 hours a day, hopelessly, right before, you know, an important exam. It's beautifully put that uh, love is the, the highest ideal to reach for, and truth is... It's handmade. I, try, I thought about that for a long time, right? This hierarchy of ideal. And the thing about truth, that bitter truth, let's say, that cynical truth, is it can break the shackles of naivety. And actually, a burnt cynicism is a moral improvement over a blind naivety, even though one is in some ways positive, but only because it's protected, and the other is bitter and dark, but still better. But you're not done at that point, you're just barely started. I think optimally we exist to have something like a playful adventure, right? We're built for an optimal challenge. It's partly why we like to play, because in play you find an optimal challenge. It's almost like the definition of play. And so if you can organize yourself and the world optimally, then you have adventure and maybe have the adventure of your life. And if you can do that, brilliantly, then you can do it in a spirit of play. That's what you need and want. I saw an endless repetition in my clinical practice and in my own private life, when my eyes were open, the consequences of not saying what was true. It's like whatever hell you might fall into by opening your mouth when you have something to say that isn't popular, it's nothing like the hell that you're going to envelop yourself in if you lose control of your own tongue and mind. And I, like I said, in my clinical practice, I never saw anyone get away with anything even once. And so all you have in a situation like that is what is the truth. Now, you know, of course, you only have your approximations to the truth, but that's better than nothing. And so you need to be afraid of the right thing. And you should be afraid of contaminating your soul with deceit. That's what you should be afraid of. What happens is, you know, garbage in, garbage out, the old programmer saying goes, and so you'll fill your head with nonsense and no one will call you on it except you, but you can still that voice if you try hard enough. You just wait until you get in real trouble. You know, one day there'll come a point where you have to make a decision, and the decision is the difference between life and death, or worse, between someone else's life and death, or worse, between health and the suffering that's worse than death. And because you've compromised yourself to such a degree, you will not be able to rely on your judgment and you will make the mistake you shouldn't make. And then you're done. And that will absolutely happen. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you set what's great against what's tragic. Yeah. I mean, but, what else could you possibly do? And so then you say, well, how do you find what's great in your own life? And part of that is you watch. It's like, when is it that I'm doing something that alleviates my suffering? 
right? Mm. It's a real, you have to ask that question to yourself honestly. One of the things you have them do is say, well, why don't you just watch for a week, like watch yourself like you don't know who you are and just see when you're not quite as miserable. Yeah. And then let's see if we can figure out what it is about what you're doing in that situation that's lifting the gloom. It's like, okay, okay, there's something in that that's curative, right? And mm -hmm. that's something in that that's curative is related to, well, you might say your purpose. It's like maybe part of the reason you're depressed is because you're too isolated. Well, now we can work on that. So let's see if we can increase the amount of time you're spending with your friends by like 20%. Or maybe you need a couple of new friends. Or maybe you need to work on your comic material, you know, because you can set that against the tragedy of life. You said that a harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a very dangerous man who has that under voluntary control. How should people become more dangerous? Becoming more articulate is definitely, I would say, that's the primary array of weapons. So, I mean, physical prowess is something, and, and it's not nothing, that physical confidence that comes along with that as well. But the same thing replicated at the level of the ability to communicate and to think, and that's a way broader field of battle and opportunity. You want to take your rightful place in the kingdom? It's like, get your tongue straight, man. Get it under control in the highest possible sense. There's nothing that makes you more formidable than verbal competence and being able to articulate, be able to think, to marshal your arguments, right? It's a battlefield metaphor. Get everything in order, all your information straight, you know, to marshal your forces. Is it possible to have too much responsibility, to take too much responsibility for yourself? That... You can, for sure. Yeah, definitely. You know, Dostoevsky said that every man was responsible for everything he did and, and for everything that everyone else does. Which is kind of an insane statement, but also somewhat it's true in, in, in a certain sense. You do have an indefinite responsibility, and you do have an indefinite capacity to bear that responsibility, but that doesn't mean it can't be crushing. And then I would say the antidote to that is that you're not in this alone. As your responsibilities mount and your opportunities increase, you have to delegate more and more. It's important that you do everything you can, but there's enough for everyone to do. And so you might say, well, the heroic path is one that leads to universal redemption. And that's true. And you might say, well, that's all on you. It's like, it is in a sense. But then the problem that you just described, it, it can be unsustainable, right? You can torture yourself for not doing it well enough. And it is up to you, but it's not up to you alone. It's not up to you alone. So you delegate and you, and you, you help build people around you so that they're all working in the same direction. You're, it's an effort, it's an effort multiplier in any case. And you make sure that they get credit. Credit isn't exact, credit's good enough. It's, it's not exactly right. The rewards are, are in accordance with their efforts and you can distribute that. If you can routinize someone, something and parse it off to someone else, say here's a little kingdom for you and it doesn't have to be little and it's something that can grow, but here's a kingdom for you well, then you can go off and do the next thing you need to do, which is extremely important. You know, and you might think there's there's a kingdom and then it's broken into little kingdoms. And so the farther you are down the hierarchy, the smaller the kingdom you get. But that's only true if you think the world's a zero sum game, because you could also think of it as a place of indefinite number of the largest kingdoms possible. And I think, what, why do we think this is exhaustible in some sense, what we're doing? It doesn't look exhaustible. You know, that's the limits to growth mentality. It's like, economists don't believe in that because they think, well, no, we can just get more efficient, which we certainly are. We're way more efficient than we once were. And those gains in efficiency, when they're not being interfered with, are increasing at more than an arithmetic rate. Why do you think people have a tendency toward that zero-sum mentality? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are elements of life that have a zero-sum element. I mean, if you're competing with another man, for example, to marry a particular woman, that's a zero-sum game. If yep. you only think of the game as including you two and that woman. So you can set up circumstances that are zero-sum. But to take, take that metaphor of zero-sum game, where there has to be winners and losers because there's a finite number of resources, is to assume that the rules of that game are the rules that govern all game, the set of all games. And that's just not true. There's 
games are infinitely multipliable. I mean, you can invent a new game. People do that all the time. The man who invented Catan, which is a game I really like to play, it's a very popular board game. That didn't exist until he invented it. Now, you know, thousands and thousands of people play it, and he made a fortune from it. It's like that game never existed. So there doesn't seem to be any limit to the number of games we can inv invent. And it's a complicated problem because we are on a single planet, and some resources are more zero-sum than others. But we haven't really run into any actual zero-sum limits in terms of our you know, the probability of us living an abundant life on the planet. We've, we've stewarded some resources very stupidly. We've, we've done a very bad job of, of managing oceanic production, for example. And we have to be smart about our resources, but that doesn't mean they're zero sum. And certainly doesn't mean the world is a zero sum game. And that's a Malthusian idea, you know, that population will grow till it consumes all available resources and precipitously collapse. And then why do we think apocalyptically? It's, well, because things do come to sudden ends. People die, people get fatal illnesses, like the world you so carefully constructed can be blown apart at any moment by a random occurrence, genetic mutation that causes the cancer that kills you. Like Life has a fundamentally apocalyptic aspect. And we do understand that because we're self-conscious, and then it's very difficult not to apply that kind of apocalyptic reasoning to things as such. The world's going to burn up. The climate's too hot. What about runaway positive feedback loops? Because that's what the climate types are afraid of. It's like, hey, they happen. How do we bind our apocalyptic thinking? That's a good question, man. That's a good question. We do that with the truth. That's how we do it. Through dialogue, through investigation, through exploration, through discipline, all of that. The Logos is the antidote to the apocalypse. And so what does that mean? Well, love and truth is the antidote to the apocalypse. Not the planet has too many people on it. Truth in the service of love. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, it's a hierarchy of virtue, I would say. You know, there's an old idea that God is the sum of all that's good. I don't think sum is exactly the right metaphor. It's more like, imagine there are eternal verities, truth, beauty, justice, love, courage fortitude, compassion. Think of all those things as virtues. So virtue is what all virtues have in common. That's the relationship of God to the good. Or you may think, how would that manifest itself in your life? Well, that might be pursuit of the good. And that's the pursuit of the good that unites all proximal goods. Well, what is that exactly? Well, it's something like belief that it would be for the best that all things flourish to the degree that that's possible. When, when I was a clinician, I thought of that as the good in me serving the best in my clients. And I think the desire for that to happen, that's love. So that's the desire for, you say, well, you take a human, bent, broken, miserable, malevolent, hurt, corrupt, weak, frustrating, disappointing, all of those things that we can lay on ourselves because of our inadequacies. It's like, it's easy to dismiss that. And part of that dismissal is what drives the notion that the planet has too many people on it and that we're a cancer on the face of the earth. It's like, it's not easy to love that. But what do you want? You want the broken people to rise up out of their brokenness rather than despise them for it. And then you orient yourself towards that and try to pull that out of people and yourself. Keep facing challenges voluntarily. Pay attention at a rate that works for you develop your competence, that actually stabilizes the environment around you, so it's act it actually is less predictable and less threatening, plus you accrue that evidence, and you get the social support for doing so. That's your best pathway forward. If you do what it is that you're called upon to do, which is to lift your eyes up above the mundane, daily, selfish, impulsive issues that might beset you and attempt to enter into a contractual relationship with that which you might hold in the highest regard, whatever that might be, to aim high and to make that important above all else in your life, that that fortifies you against the vicissitudes of existence like nothing else can. And I truly believe that that's the most practical advice that you could possibly receive. The way that you fortify your faith in life is to assume the best, something like that, and then to act courageously in relationship to that. 
And, and that's, that's tantamount to expressing your faith in the highest possible good. It's tantamount to expressing your faith in God. And it's not a matter of stating, well, I believe in the existence of a transcendent de- deity, because in some sense, who cares, who cares what you believe? I mean, you might and all that, but, but that's not the issue. That's not the issue. The issue, it seems to me, is how you act. The issue is not what you believe as if it's a set of facts, but how you conduct yourself in the world. The purpose of thinking is to let your thoughts die instead of you. It's a brilliant notion. And so the idea is something like, you can conjure up a representation of yourself. You can conjure up a variety of potential representations of yourself in the, in the future. You can lay out how those future representations of yourself are likely to prevail or fail. You can call the potential yous in the future that will fail, and then you can embody the ones that will succeed. You do that well simultaneously, conjuring up a representation of your current state and determining for yourself because of your undue suffering, which elements of your pathetic being need to be given up so that you can move forward into that future. And the goal, what is it that you're aiming at with that work and that sacrifice? That's the ultimate question. What is it that you're trying to do? Well, you're trying to improve the future. We believe that the future can be improved. We believe that it can be improved as a consequence of our sacrificial work. And so, once again, what are the limitations? What are the limits to that? What are the necessary limits to that? I would say we don't know. We conjured up this remarkable idea. The future exists. We can see it even though it's only potential. We can adjust our behavior in the present in order to maximize our probability of success in the future. How best to do that? Well, the idea is something like, don't hesitate to offer the ultimate sacrifice if you want the future to turn out ultimately well what is it that you could contract for let's say if you were willing to give up everything about you that's weak and unworthy the proper sacrificial attitude produces a psychological state And then a social state that's a manifestation of that attitude that decreases the probability that the world will careen into hell and increases the probability that people will live high quality, meaningful, private lives in a society that's balanced and capable of supporting that. And none of that seems to me to be questionable, really. I also don't think it's anything that people don't actually know. You know, people have told me many times that when they listen to me talk, they're hearing things that they already knew but didn't know how to say. It's something like that. And this is one of those things that I think is exactly like that. I mean, I think it's at the very core of our moral knowledge, and which is our behavioral knowledge and our perceptual knowledge. I mean, let's get this straight. Moral knowledge is no trivial matter. It's knowledge about how it is that you orient yourself in the world. There's no more profoundly necessary form of knowledge. Well, it's predicated on, on something that's exactly like this. We know that we have to make sacrifices. We know that we have to aim at what's good. So then why isn't that we don't aim at what's best and make the sacrifices that are necessary in order to bring that into play? I think it seems to me that in some sense that's self-evident. The question is why we don't do it, but there's answers to that too. Life is hard and it hurts people. It's rife with limitation and some of it's arbitrary and some of it's unjust and some of it's worse, some of it's malevolent, which is even worse. It's not surprising that that combination of vicissitude can turn people against being. But I think even when that happens, and even when people have the kind of history that if they revealed to you, you would say, well, it's no wonder you turned out that way. The people who turn out that way still know that it's wrong. They still know that however deep their own suffering, however arbitrary their own suffering, however much that's caused by the malevolence of others, as well as the tragedy of existence, that that does not in any way justify their turning away from the good. And I believe everyone knows that. I believe that they know it implicitly, even if they don't allow themselves to know it explicitly. 
And I believe that if they violate that idea, then they violate themselves and that they end up in Cain's position, which is the position of the man who's been given a punishment that is too great to bear. Now we're capable of making sacrifices in abstraction, right? To conceptualize a future that we want, to let go of the things that are stopping us from moving forward and to free ourselves from the chains of our original preconceptions. Pursue pleasure, to follow your impulses, live for the moment, do what's expedient. A mountain is something you have to climb and you have to climb to the pinnacle of a mountain and the mountain is up, right? And the mountain stretches up to heaven and it's a long journey to specify the right place on the highest pinnacle. And, and that's symbolic because of course it's a pinnacle that you're always trying to reach, just like you're always trying to aim, you're always trying to climb upward, at, at least that's the theory, it depends to some degree, of course, on your definition of upward. You're supposed to, again, to act out the highest good of which you're capable. Now that'll transform your life to some degree into an archetypal adventure. There's no way around that, because as you attempt to climb a higher mountain, let's say, or to aim at a higher target or something like that, then the things around you will become increasingly dramatic and of import. That ha happens by necessity, obviously, because if you're aiming at something difficult and profound and you're really working at it, then your life is going to become perhaps increasingly difficult and profound. But that might be okay. You might, that might be exactly what you need as an antidote to the implicit limitations that face you as a human being. The good father is precisely someone who is willing to sacrifice his child to the ultimate good. You have a moral obligation as a parent to encourage your child to go out into the world, right? And to be whoever they can be. To be the best they can possibly be. And in doing that, you're encouraging them to pursue the good. You're sacrificing them to the good. You're not keeping them for yourself selfishly. You're telling them that they can go out and live their life and live it properly. You don't want for your son what it is that you want for him. You want for your son what would be best for him and for the world. And you let go in precise proportion to your desire to have that happen. When you have an infant, you do everything for the infant because the infant can do nothing for him or herself. But as the infant matures and is increasingly capable of doing things for him or herself, then you pull back, right? You pull back and every time the child develops the ability to do something, you allow them or encourage them to do it and you don't interfere. You know, so if your child is struggling getting dressed, well, obviously there's some times that you help them, but mostly you let them learn so that they can know how to do it in the future. That's better for you and it's certainly better for them. There's a rule if you're working with the elderly in an old age home and the rule is something like, don't do anything for any of the guests, let's say, that they can do for themselves because you compromise their independence. And so as a mother, you pull back and you pull back and you let your child hit him or herself against the world and you fail to protect them. But by failing to protect them, you encourage and ennoble them to the point where you're no longer necessary. Now, they may still want to see you and it would be wonderful if that was the case, but the point is, is that you're supposed to remove yourself from the equation by encouraging your child to be the best possible person that person can be. And you sacrifice your desires all of your desires to that, your personal desires, even your desires for your child in relationship to you. Because you want them to move forward into the world as a light, right? As a light on a hill. That's what you want if you have any sense. And so you don't get to keep your children at home because you need them. If you don't know what you're doing, you don't know where you are. And you don't know where you're going. And if you're in a place where you don't know where you are or where you're going, you're in danger because that's unmapped territory and God only knows what lurks in unmapped territory. If you're so confused and disoriented that you don't know where you are or where you're going, 
There are predators of the spirit who are much worse than snakes that are waiting for you. And the probability that you'll move from aimless, hopeless, joyless anxiety to nihilism, corrosive bitterness, and genocidal fantasy in the fundamental extreme is very high. It's like, well, I just want to be happy. It's a slogan. It's the most common slogan of our time, I would say. And it's such a preposterous slogan. It's like, what do you mean just? You just want to be happy. That's all. That's all you want. That absolute impossibility. You want bliss unending, no matter what you do. And that's, that's all you want. It's, it's, it's not exactly a small ask, let's say. Because it's the same thing as asking to dwell permanently in paradise. It's something like that. And then it is also isn't true. That isn't what you want. If you do careful analysis of what people mean when they say they just want to be happy, what they mean is they don't want to suffer stupidly. They're much more concerned, we're much more concerned with not experiencing an excess of negative emotion than we are with experiencing a surfeit of positive pleasure. So first of all, we don't mean we just want to be happy. We mean, please don't make us too miserable. And, and fair enough, that's reasonable. But then even on the happiness front, even on the absence of misery front, that's not true. It's like it isn't obvious at all that we want happiness. It isn't even obvious that we want absence of misery. What's really obvious is that we want an adventure. Right? We want an adventure that's so compelling that it makes the misery of life not just justifiable, but, but worthwhile. You want to look back in your life, and, and you know this to be true. You, you want to be able to say to yourself, even considering a month or a week or a series of days, you want to be able to say, that was really difficult, but you know what? It was worth it. And I think that's what you want from your life. It's something like, you know what? That was difficult, but it was worth it. And that meant that the adventure was so great that it justified the difficulties. And so then the question is, and here's the question, where do you find the great adventure of your life? Well, how about in truth? Well, why? Because you don't know what's going to happen if you tell the truth. It's a mystery. It's going to lay itself out for you. And, and, and so that's an adventure because you don't, you literally do not know what's going to happen. You have to let go of knowing what's going to happen. And so then you have that adventure. And then what is also the case is that it's you that's having the adventure, right? Because if, if what you're doing is living in truth, that's your, that's you, that truth is you. And so that means that whatever happens when you tell the truth is your adventure. And, and then you think, well, I'm using deception. It's like, well, maybe you are, but maybe deception is using you. And then maybe it's the spirit of deception that's having the adventure of your life. And then you might ask yourself, well, why are you so miserable and unhappy? And the answer would be, well, the spirit of deception is having the adventure of your life. You're not even there. Because if you're not living in truth, you're not there. Obviously, what's there is the spirit of deception. And you might think that's your deception, but I would be very careful about thinking that because there has been there have been centuries of meditation on the nature of the spirit of deception and the answer isn't that the spirit of deception is you the answer is that the spirit of deception is something that possesses you convinces you that it's you and that's not something you want to fall into the clutches of the world is founded on a sacrifice Right? And that's, that's what the crucifix represents. And European towns were built around a church and the church was built around an altar and the altar was built around the idea of self sacrifice. So the sacrifice, the proper sacrifice is at the center of the community. That's what that idea means. Now you might ask, well, what's the proper sacrifice? And the answer is something like the voluntary willingness to bury your cross. And then you might say, well, what is your cross? And the answer to that is, well, that's the catastrophe of your life, right? That's the fact you'll be betrayed, the fact that you're going to die, the fact that you're going to be in pain, the fact that your loved ones will see you suffer, the fact that the mob will come after you, the fact that criminals might be preferred to you, etc. It's all the potential catastrophes of your life. And then the, the sacrifice is the idea that you 
you have to you have to let your what would you say you have to let your narrow ego go enough so that you pick all that up voluntarily all of that and then that transforms it and i think i think that's literally true i think that's what all this that's what all the psychological evidence points to is that if you adopt a stance of voluntary challenge even in relationship to tragedy and malevolence that that's the pathway to transcendence do you have something to say that you're not saying if if you do then it's your fault this is your fault it's your problem and you might say well i'm too afraid to talk it's like fair enough how afraid are you not to talk you know people say to me frequently they compliment me on my bravery and i think you don't understand i'm not brave i don't i don't like conflict i'm way more afraid of losing control of my tongue than i am of the consequences of saying what i have to say because i know what happens when we allow other people to control our tongues it's not good it's not good it's hell itself and so of course it's troublesome to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune when you say what you have to say it's like that's fine try not saying what you have to say well that'll be okay in the moments like yeah in the moment but unfortunately your whole life isn't in the moment practice in developing the capacity for skilled movement forward in a manner that simultaneously encourages the others that you're cooperating with to do precisely the same thing and that's not some arbitrary ethos it's it's not arbitrary because if that doesn't happen then nothing flourishes and if it does happen then everything flourishes it's also not relativistic in some sense because you have to do that no matter what you're doing no matter what it is that you're doing if you do that well you're doing whatever it is you're doing well in fact that's really in some sense how you would define well if you give up enough psychologically you'll you'll cut your losses in actuality and of course that's sort of what thoughts for is right so that you can you can get yourself straight you can give it up in abstraction so you don't act out the pathology and then and then nothing dies in actuality but that still means you have something to give up you want to initiate a process of active engagement with the dragon that burned you fundamentally the psychophysiological pattern of active engagement is the opposite to the psychophysiological pattern of involuntary stress and so if you can practice embodying that voluntary confrontation then that stance can come to dominate and that's the stance you want to dominate because that moves you forward voluntarily into the world and so and that in all probability that that will work I want to be free to do what I want. Okay, well hang on a sec. Which I are you talking about there? Are you talking about the mature I that sees next week and next month and next year and 10 years out and that takes the community into account? Or are you talking about the impulsive, hedonistic, self-serving narrow I that just wants exactly what it wants right now? And what makes you think that when you make a case for that hedonism that you're not just falling under the sway of an impulsive short-sighted demon so to speak if you look at music for example music operates by very sophisticated rules and so it's ordered and constrained but out of that rules system of rules comes an in, almost infinite array of possibility and so you know we have this sense i think it derives from rousseau that any constraint of order is a limit on freedom when what we should be hypothesizing is that with the optimal set of principles you get the maximally desirable freedom and it it's not freedom from everything and it's not freedom to do anything it's certainly not a narrow hedonistic freedom because that backfires on you like the next day this is i think why people are so obsessed in some sense with the search for fundamental meaning this is a good story so you can imagine two people laying bricks they're building a gigantic wall and the one person thinks oh my god you know this wall is going to take 100,000 bricks i'm laying one at a time and i'm wasting my life away trivially adding to this gigantic brick wall and what am i doing this is absolutely miserable 
brick by brick. And the other person thinks, in 300 years, this is going to be a cathedral. And so the person in the second state is doing exactly the same thing at a local level, laying bricks, but each brick is related to a very high goal. And that means the reward that's attendant upon the laying of the brick is proportional to the goal of the entire behavioral process. So if you're aimless and, and goalless, then you can't elicit any positive emotion. And if your goals are fragmented, which is also what happens if you're aimless or your goals lack unity, if your goals are fragmented, then no given behavioral manifestation can elicit any dopaminergic reward because it's not a step forward to anything desirable. One of the things, well, I did write about this in my first book, particularly about putting your life, putting your house in perfect order. It's like, well, if, you, if you're lost, one of the things you can do is look around and see what direction you could take locally. Fix something. Find something that you could do that would make things better that you would do. And there's a humility in that too, because especially if you're in a low energy state, it's like, oh my God, you know, I don't have enough energy to make dinner. It's like, do you have enough energy to put a fork on the table? And sometimes people are so depressed that that's really all they can do. Can you take a small step forward, no matter how small that is? Implement a micro routine, even something like washing a cup and putting it back in the shelf. And you know that's a good thing because you have a shelf and there's cups on it. You've already decided that's an appropriate way to live is to have your coffee cups on a shelf. If you go ahead with cleaning out the cup and putting it on the shelf, then you've taken steps towards a, a valuable micro goal. You get a dopamine kick from that. That transforms itself into adrenaline and energizes you. But in part, what the dopamine system is doing. So imagine that the purpose of the dopamine system is to elicit a satiating reward, fundamentally. But then the satiating reward is something that has to be approached in, in steps. And so in order to maintain the motivation necessary to approach the satiating reward, you have to mark each of the steps with a, with a marker of pleasure. Small things are not small. You might have the cognitive appraisal that doing something local, like cleaning up your room, is small, but it's not obvious at all that that's the case. It's not, it's not that trivial to put your immediate surroundings in order. And it can easily be the stepping stone to putting things in order on a broader scale. In fact, it's probably the necessary stepping stone to do that. You can pat yourself on the back, especially if you're depressed a little harder than you might otherwise by saying, you know, you say, well, this is trivial, but I did it. It's like, no, if you're moving ahead, that's not small. You just keep doing that, you're gonna get out of this paralyzed or retreat mode. If you're in the zone of proximal development, you're pushing your skill development one increment forward. And it's one that you can actually manage. Imagine that you have someone who's habitually avoidant. And maybe they're avoidant because when they become possessed by negative emotion, they become hyper aware of their internal state and they feel the panic. And so then they freeze or retreat. And they do that constantly. And then they're in this terrible negative emotional state all the time because every time they see a stimulus that's associated with retreat, they get gripped by these interoceptive sensations. And so you say to them, well, we're gonna reverse that instead of you being gripped by that, you're going to expose yourself to that voluntarily. See, if you do that repeatedly with people, not only do they stop being afraid of the things that you're that you're showing them, that you're exposing them to, but they become more likely to approach other things they're afraid of, far more likely. In fact, it doesn't exactly look like people get more less afraid at all. It looks like what happens is they learn to get braver. One of the phenomenon, cognitive phenomena, that loads very heavily on neuroticism is self-consciousness. And so when you fall into anxiety, then there is this internal obsessiveness, which has to do with the panoply of sins in some sense. Which parts of me are malfunctioning and need to be eradicated? And one of the things I used to do with my socially anxious clients, so they would go into a social situation, often with eyes downcast, by the way, and they would be so intensely concentrating on their own internal sensations that they would fail to make eye contact with anybody they were talking to. And then they would be awkward because they weren't reading the cues they could have read if they would have only looked. And then the conversation would become disjointed 
and then they would get anxious and fall into themselves. And so one of the things that I taught them to do wasn't to try to calm themselves down, but to try to calm the other person down. So when you go into a social situation, pay more attention to the other person. Like just focus your attention outward. And if the person had any social skill, sometimes I had clients who had no social skills. And so they were anxious socially because they actually didn't know how to behave socially. So then you had to teach them the social skills. But some of them had the skills but wouldn't activate them because they were so neurotically obsessed with their own inadequacy that they failed to attend to the cues that would elicit the proper responses. And all they had to learn to do was watch. And then they would automatically respond because they knew how to have a conversation. See, the reason that socially anxious people are so interoceptive is it's involuntary, right? They get gripped by the negative emotion and then that produces this intense, obsessive interoception. That might not happen if they did it voluntarily. This is why exposure therapy works so well in, in psychotherapy is like, well, I'm afraid of something and if I go near it, then I'm possessed by negative emotion. Well, that's if you go near it accidentally. I'm gonna have you go near it purposefully and what you're going to find is that to the degree that you do it purposefully, that response will be quelled. And that happens. It's extraordinarily reliable. Imagine you anticipate something and then you make a mistake. Now the question then becomes, how significant is the mistake? The depressive takes that punishment response, let's say, that's a consequence of failed anticipation and can't bind it. It just, it just takes out all of their potential future selves. And so then they're in a depressive pit. That's too much learning from failure. That binding problem is really tricky. One of the rules of thumb for that that's extremely use useful, that's socially instantiated, is innocent until proven guilty. So you might say when those thoughts come up, because they're adversarial and accusatory thoughts, you might say, well, that is part of the realm of possibility. but. When your child does something wrong that's minor, you don't say you're a rotten kid. You bind it, you say, look kid, here's a bunch of things you're doing right. But in this particular example, specific situation, here's the minimal thing you did incorrectly and how to alter it. And it's a really good habit of mind to address towards yourself as well as to other people, which is to say, well, what's the minimum crime that I'm responsible for in this moment? And that's part of this miracle of the presumption of innocence, and especially without proof. A lot of what I did in my clinical practice to people who had a depressive temperament was help them make a case for themselves. It's like, well, maybe you're as bad as you think you might be, but maybe not. Let's take the contrary argument and only narrow the repair to the absolute minimum that needs to be manifested. Sometimes when you make one little mistake, it is actually an indicator of a flaw in your character. But most of the time it isn't. And it certainly can't be responded to that all the time because then you'd never be able to make a mistake without wiping yourself completely out. You want to make it as local and precise as you possibly can. And that's also one of the advantages to removing yourself from a rage or an anxiety state because a rage or an anxiety state is low resolution and global. And so it'll be globally accusatory. So you want to specify it and you think, okay, well, what's the, what's the minimum necessary behavioral transformation to ensure that similar mistakes are not replicated in the future? It's like if your roof leaks, you don't have to dig a new foundation. You can just fix a few shingles. And you might think, well, the rain's coming through, so you have to tear down the whole house. It's like, well, no. And you might panic and run around because the water's coming in, but it's still a bad idea to dig up the foundations every time something trivial maintenance problem needs to emerge. And so one of the things that's very useful to learn is like, well, is this only a trivial maintenance problem? And one of the advantages to that too is that if it's not the collapse of your entire self, let's say, and it's a trivial maintenance problem, you're much more able to activate that, that courageous response to anomaly that's part and parcel of exploratory behavior and eventual success. 
So when part of the trick of, of, of many sorts of, well, I would say religious training enterprises, certainly the meditative enterprises, is something like, how do you tell yourself a story, like a real story, though a story that actually works, where you can confidently approach the thing that's blocking your path? How do we come to know ourselves in terms of our personalities and more importantly, potential? One of the first ways to come to know yourself is to understand that you don't. You know, you can learn to kind of watch yourself like you're watching a stranger. So you have to understand that you don't know who you are. And that's not easy to understand because you think you know. But then, you know, you remember you can't control yourself very well. You're not very disciplined. You're full of flaws. Maybe you don't know yourself as well as you think. But it's hard to get low enough to understand how deeply it is the case that you are ignorant about who you are. Now, there's an upside to that, too, which also is that you're also ignorant about who you could be. And so the discovery of that, you know, is some reward for the horror of determining who you actually are. Then you watch yourself. You watch yourself like you're watching a stranger. You watch what you say and you listen. You think, well, what, what sort of person would say that? And how am I reacting emotionally when I'm communicating in that manner? You know, is that making me feel stronger, weaker? Is it, is, it, is it filling me with shame? Is it helping my confidence? Am I laying out a lie? Am I deceiving myself and other people? Am I adopting this personality at parties that is designed to impress and to amuse and it comes across as nothing but like self-centered narcissism? Um, what are my dark fantasies? What are my aggressive fantasies? What is it that I'm willing to do? What am I interested in so that I'll spontaneously pursue it? What do I procrastinate about and why? What am I unwilling to do? What do I think is good? What do I congratulate myself for accomplishing? And what do I berate myself for failing to confront and to implement? Those are all incredibly complicated questions and you don't know the answers to them. So that's a start. And then in terms of potential, well, you'll discover a little bit more about your potential as you discover who you are, especially the darker parts of yourself, because then you discover your potential for mayhem. There's some real utility in that, you know, the discovery that you're dangerous. It's such a useful discovery. It's actually something that strengthens you because the first thing that a realization like that can in fact produce is the ambition to incorporate that danger into a higher order personality. And that can make you implacable. That can make you someone who can say no when you need to say no. You know, that can make you someone who won't avoid necessary conflict. And so that's unbelievably useful. And so that's one of the potentials that you might discover. The other thing you do to discover your potential is to, well, you challenge yourself. You know, it's like, take a bit of a look at yourself and think, about what's not so good that you could improve, that you should improve by your own standards and that you would improve, you know, and set yourself a little goal. Um, you know, maybe you're not studying at all at, at, at your university, or maybe you're, maybe you're at work and you've got this stack of paper there, you know, and you haven't looked at that damn stack for like a month and you know that you should be, and you're bothering yourself at night because you're avoiding that. It's like maybe, Think, well, I've avoided that stack of paper completely for one month. I'm quite a coward when it comes to whatever snakes might be hidden in that stack of paper. How about tomorrow I just like put that stack of paper in front of me on my desk and I like I glance through it for 15 seconds. See if I can do that. It's like, well, you set yourself a goal of improvement. You know, it's a humble goal. There's things you could do to improve and you know what they are. And there's small steps that you could take that you might take that would put you in that direction. And then the question is, are you big enough to take those small steps? You know, are you capable of grappling with the fact that you're fundamentally flawed to the point where you have to break things down into almost childlike steps in order to manage them? And the answer to that is, yeah, you are. Most people have things they avoid you know, and they're afraid of. So I would say to some degree, it's the lot of everyone.
people vary in the degree to which they've conquered that. And you do meet people from time to time who are extraordinarily disciplined. But most of the time they've got disciplined in exactly this manner. It's through slow incremental improvement. And then you challenge yourself. It's like, well, could I do this? That would be better. Then you find out and then you think, well, is there something slightly larger and more challenging that I could do that would be better? And, and you try it and you find out. And as you try it and you find out, generally you get better at it and you can take on larger and larger challenges. You know, you take responsibility for yourself. That's part of standing up straight with your shoulders back. It's like, take on the world, man. But only at the level that you can manage. When you're ignorant and biased and deeply flawed and immature, it's where everyone starts. You don't want to take, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew, but it doesn't mean that you can't wrestle with, with part of reality. You know, some part that's small enough so that you have a good shot at victory. And then you attain victory over some small part of the chaos. And then you're the person who's victorious over chaos. You're just a beginner, but that's who you are. And then maybe you can get unbelievably good at that. And you do that by challenging yourself humbly at the level that you're able to function. It's easier to understand if you think about a child that you're trying to rear properly and you want to make that child, help that child reveal their, their highest potential, whatever that is, whatever that means. And what you do is you don't set them a series of impossible tasks in the hope of undermining their self-confidence. You form a relationship with them that is predicated on your interest in their highest mode of being. And then you offer them challenges that are precisely optimized to their ability, right? So they can do them, but they have to stretch. The two elements of their ability would be what they can do and what, and how much they're capable of transforming what they can do. And an optimal challenge is stretches you to the end of what you can do and then into the domain of, of how you can transform. You have to be humble and wise enough to understand that you might have to aim pretty damn low, especially in those places where you're not functioning well. And it might be so embarrassing that you can't, that you can't bring yourself to fathom that that's actually who you are. You need the loss of that arrogant ego because it's precisely what's interfering with your movement forward. You know, it's part of the adversarial process, mythologically speaking, that stops moral progress. You're too proud of who you think you are to notice what you're like so that you could change properly. You don't want to sacrifice that part of yourself. It's probably associated with some delusion that helps you maintain a positive, although very fragile self image, you know, in the absence of genuine effort, it's not to be recommended. So you know yourself by watching and paying attention. It's not thinking exactly. It's not imagination. It's just, it's watching like you're a like you're a snake, because a, a snake watches like cold-bloodedly, with no emotional reaction, just to see what's there. It doesn't allow what is wanted or desired to interfere with what is observed. So you watch yourself like that, as if you don't know who you are. Well, that's the beginning, and then you challenge yourself continually to see how far past yesterday you could push today and tomorrow and to continually experiment with expanding the domains not only of your competence but of your ability to increase that competence. The, the upper limit to that is proportional to the moral effort that you put into it. The more that's guided by the highest of all possible visions, right? The alliance with the highest of all possible conceivable good. The more it's accompanied by truth in speech and action, the more you will develop your potential. And I believe that potential to be as un unlimited in the upward direction, more unlimited in the upward direction than it is unlimited in the direction that brings people to, to the political and social hells that so often characterize the world that we inhabit. And so 
you also, I suppose, have to be willing to undertake that as an adventure because it's a hell of a thing to bear that kind of responsibility. It takes a person out of the ordinary. It takes them out of themselves. But there's deep meaning to be had in it and it's and there isn't anything better that you can do. Everyone in their right mind knows that there's a million ways of doing things wrong and one way, if you're lucky, to do things right. And so the notion that it's a, a very, very narrow pathway that you tread upon if you're doing things right, that's wisdom. That's the line between chaos and order that you're supposed to be on constantly, right? It's a very, very thin line because if you're a little bit too far in one direction, then it's too much chaos. And if you're a little too far in the other direction, then it's too much order. And both of those aren't good. It has to, the balance has to be exactly right. And you can feel that. And I truly believe you can feel that. And I think it's your deepest instinct. It's your deepest instinct. And I mean that, I mean that biologically. I don't mean that metaphorically. I think that your psyche is arranged to exist in a cosmos that's composed of chaos and order. I think that's why you have the hemispheric structure that you have. And then when you feel as if you're meaningfully engaged in the world, when the terror of your mortality strips away and you're engaged and it's timeless, that's the deepest instinct you have telling you that you're in the right place at the right time. And then what you do is practice being there, practice being there. And that's that that narrow spot that's so difficult to find. You wander around it, maybe if you're lucky. You can watch, you can watch. This is an experiment. Watch yourself for two weeks, like you don't know who you are, because you don't. So watch yourself for two weeks and notice there's gonna be times when things are proper. They're arrayed properly for you. you it, it's not easy to notice because when they're arrayed like that, you're so engaged, you, you don't exactly notice, you know? But you'll see, oh, I'm in the right place. It's like, okay, how'd I get here? What am I doing right? You know, how is it that this could happen more often? I'd like this to happen more often. How would I have to conduct myself in order for that to happen more often? And then you practice that. And then maybe instead of 10 minutes a month or 10 minutes a week, it's like 15 minutes a day. And then it's half an hour a day. And then it's an hour a day. And then it's four hours a day. And maybe if you're, if you're extraordinarily careful, then you get to a point where you're like that a good proportion of the time. You are not the master of your own house. There are spirits that dwell within you, meaning you have a will and you can exercise a certain amount of conscious control over your being, but there are all sorts of things that occur within you that seem to be beyond your capacity to control. Your dreams, for example, that's a really good example, or your impulses, for example, you might, you might think of those as so foreign from you that they're not even, you don't even want them to be part of you. But, but more subtly even, how about what you're interested in? What compels you? Like, where does that come from? Exactly. Because you can't conjure it up of your own accord, you know? So if you're a student and you're taking a difficult course, you might say to yourself, well, I need to sit down and study for three hours. But then you sit down and that isn't what happens. Your attention goes everywhere. And you might say, well, whose attention is it then if it goes everywhere? Because you say it's your attention. It's like, well, if it's your attention, maybe you would be able to control it, but you can't. And so then you might think, well, Jen, then just exactly what the hell is controlling it? And you might say, well, it's random. It's the, well, it better not be random. I can tell you that. That's, that happens to some degree in schizophrenia. There's an element of randomness in that. It's not random. It's driven by the action of phenomena that I think are best considered as something like subpersonality. You can't make yourself interested in something. Interest manifests itself and grips you. That's a whole different thing. And so what is it that's gripping you? And, and how do you conceptualize that? Is that a divine power? Well, it's divine as far as you're concerned because it grips you and you can't do anything about it. And so there's a calling in you towards what you're compelled by and what you're interested in. And sometimes that might be very dark and sometimes not, but you're compelled forward by your interest. And so the idea that what moves you away from your country and your father's house and the comforts of your childhood home is, is something that's beyond you and that you listen to and hearken to. That's exactly right. And you can say, well, I don't want to call that God. It's like, it doesn't matter what you call it exactly. It, it doesn't matter to what it is, what it's called. It still is. And if you don't listen to it, that's the other thing. If you don't listen to it, and I've been a clinician and talked to enough people now, as old as I am, to know this absolutely. If you do not listen to that thing that beckons you forward, 
You will pay for it like you cannot possibly imagine. You'll have everything that's terrible about life in your life and nothing about it that's good. And worse, you'll know that it was your fault and that you squandered what you could have had. So, this is not only a calling forth, but a warning. One of the things that I've noticed in my life is that nothing I've ever done was wasted. And by done, I mean put my heart and soul into, you know, like, like attempted with, with all of my effort. That, that always worked. Now, it didn't always work the way I expected it to work. That's a whole different issue. But the payoff from it was always positive. Something of value always accrued to me when I made the sacrifices necessary to do something worthwhile. Go somewhere you don't understand. You have to go into the unknown. And that's, that's God's first command. Go into the unknown. Because you already know what you know. And so, and that's not enough unless you think you're enough. And if you're not enough and you don't think you're enough, then you have to go where you haven't been. Get away from your family enough so that you can establish your independence. And that isn't because there's something wrong with your family. But it means get away. You know, I talk to people very frequently whose families have provided them with too much protection. And they know it themselves. And that means they're deprived of necessity. And you have to get yourself away from your dependency in order to allow necessity to drive you forward. And that's to become independent and to become mature. You know, we've been fed this unending diet of rights and freedoms, and there's something about that. There's, there's something about that that's so pathologically wrong. And people are starving for the antidote, and the antidote is truth and responsibility, right? And it, it isn't. It isn't because that's what you should do in some some I know better or someone knows better for you what you should do sense. It's that that's the secret to a meaningful life and without a meaningful life then all you have is suffering and, and nihilism and despair and all of that and self-contempt and, and that's not good and it's necessary for men to stand up and take responsibility. If you were able to reveal the best of yourself to you in the world that you would be an overwhelming force for good and that whatever errors might be made along the way would wash out in the works. If you forthrightly pursue that which God directs you to pursue, let's say, that all things are possible. And so we don't know the limits of human endeavor. We truly don't. And it, it, it's premature to put a cap on what it is that we are, what it is that we're capable of. And so, you, you know, you're already something, and maybe you're not so bad in your current configuration. But you might wonder if you did nothing for the next 30 years except put yourself together, just exactly what would you be able to do? And you might think, well, that's worth finding out. But of course, that's, that's the adoption of responsibility. There, there's lots in the world to fix. Everything that bothers you about the world and about yourself should be fixed, and you can do that. I have a friend, he lives in Montreal, his name is James Simon, he's a great painter, and he's taught me a lot of things. Help, he's helped me design my house and beautify it. And I bought some paintings from him a couple of years ago, and he did this series of paintings where he went around North America and, and stood in different places, and then he painted the view from here down and so it's his feet planted in different places on roads in the desert on the ocean yeah well you know he was trying to make a point and the point was that wherever you are it's worth paying attention and that's because you know so all these places that he visited he looked at exactly where he was I'm standing by the side of the road in the desert it's sort of mundane in some sense but then maybe he put 40 hours into that painting you know and it's, it's very very realistic painting with really good light and what he's telling you as a painter is Everything is worth paying attention to an infinite amount, but you don't have enough time. And so the artist does that for you, right? The artist looks and looks and looks and looks and looks and then gives you that vision. And so then you can look at the painting and it reminds you that everything that there is is right where you are. And that's a hard thing to realize, but it's actually true. And so I've, I've been telling people online in various ways and in lectures that they should start fixing up the world by cleaning up their room how you would like your life to be, what you would like your character to be three to five years down the road if you were taking care of yourself like you were taking care of someone that you actually cared about. So you kind of have to split yourself into two people and treat yourself like 
you like someone you have respect for and that you want the best for. And that's not easy because people don't necessarily have respect for themselves and they don't necessarily want what's the best for themselves because they, they have a lot of self-contempt and a lot of self-hatred and a lot of guilt. I think you have an obligation, it's one of the highest moral obligations, to treat yourself as if you're a creature of value. How you would like your friendships to be conducted. Because it's useful to surround yourself with people who are trying to move forward and, and more importantly, who are happy when you move forward and not happy when you move backwards. Not when you fall, that isn't what I mean, but when you're doing self-destructive things, your friends shouldn't be there to cheer you on. You look at the world through a story, you can't, you can't help it. And the, and the story is what gives value to the world or, or the story is what you extract from the value of the world. You can look at it either way. You're somewhere and it's not good enough. Right? That's the eternal human predicament. Wherever you are isn't good enough. And to some degree, that's actually a good thing because if it was good enough, well, <laughs> there's nothing for you to do. So it's actually maybe a good thing that it's insufficient. And that might be why sometimes having less is, is better than having more. And, and I don't want to be a Pollyanna about that. I mean, I know that there's deprivation that can reach to the point where it's, where it's completely counterproductive. But it isn't always the case that starting with little is... You, if you start with little, you start with more possibility. It's something like that. So you move from always from what's unbearable about the present to some better future, right? And if you don't have that, then you have nothing but threat and, and negative emotion. You have no positive emotion because the positive emotion is generated in the conception of the better future and then the evidence that you generate yourself that you're moving towards it. That's where the positive and fulfilling meaning of life comes. So you want to set up this structure properly. It's very, very important. And so what it means is that you want to be going somewhere that's good enough so that the going is worth the while. And you can ask yourself that. And, well, we know what's wrong with life. It's rife with suffering and insufficiency and deception and evil. It's all of that, obviously. Okay, what would make the journey worthwhile? Well, you can ask yourself that. It's like... All right, in order to bear up under this load, what is it that I would need to be striving to attain? And if you ask yourself that, that's to knock and, and the door will open. That's what that means. If you ask yourself that, then you will find an answer and you'll think, you'll shrink away from it. You'll think, well, there's no way I could do that. It's like, well, you don't know what you could do. You don't know what's possible. And you're not as much as you could be. And so God only knows what you could, what you could do and have and give if you sacrificed everything to it. You have to sacrifice that which is most valuable to you currently that's stopping you. And God only knows what that is. It's certainly the worst of you. It's certainly that. And God only knows to what degree you're in love with the worst of you. The idea that what you should do if you're feeling resentful about the nature of being or suffering too much for your own life, let's say, is straighten the damn thing out. Like seriously, try it for a year even. Try it for a week. Try not doing the things you know you shouldn't do. Try not saying the things you know to be false. And just watch what happens. You might as well give it a shot, right? Because you say, well, I'm all in for a year. You know, I'm going to do things right. And then I'll just stand back and I kind of watch how things unfold. And maybe I'll reconsider at the end of that year. It's like, try it. Try it. I mean, I would say I've had thousands of letters now from people who are saying, hey, I tried that, you know, and hey, you know, it worked. I read this great line in a T.S. Eliot play called The Cocktail Party. And in it, this woman comes up to a psychiatrist and she says, you know, I'm having a really rough time of it. I'm suffering badly. My life is not going well. And, and then she says, uh, I hope that there's something wrong with me. And the psychiatrist says, what, what the hell do you mean by that? And she says, well, here's how I look at it. There's either something wrong with the world, and I'm just in it, and that's how it is. And then, like, what am I going to do about that? Because it's the whole world. Or maybe I could be fortunate, and there's something wrong with me that's causing all this unnecessary suffering. And if I, w I could just set it right. I could learn, and I could set it right. And so... Well, I've been thinking about that for a very long time. And I think, well, if your life isn't going the way it is, you know, you can find someone else to blame, which is pretty convenient for you and also relatively easy. Or you could think, okay, I don't like life. I don't like the way my life is unfolding. Um, maybe I don't like life in general because it's tragic and, and tainted with evil. 
how do I know if my judgment is accurate? And the question is, well, have I really done everything I possibly could to set my life straight? Because maybe I shouldn't be judging it, its quality or the quality of life itself or being itself for that matter. If I haven't done everything I possibly could to set my life straight. Well, so there's a, there's a task. The humility element is, it took me a long time to understand why there's religious injunctions supporting humility. To even understand what the word really meant in that sort of technical sense. And it means something like this. It means what you don't know is more important than what you know. Then, then what you don't know can start to be your friend, you see. People are very defensive about what they know. But the thing is, you don't know enough. And the re you can tell you don't know enough because your life is not what it could be. And neither is the life of the people around you. You just don't know enough. And so, what that means is that every time you encounter some evidence that you're ignorant, someone points it out, you should be happy about that because you think, oh, you just told me how I'm wrong. It's like, great! Like maybe I had to sift through a lot of nonsense to get through the real message that you're telling me, but if you could actually tell me some way that I'm wrong, and then maybe give me a hint about how to not be wrong like that, well then I wouldn't have to be wrong like that anymore. That, that would be a good thing. And You can embark on that adventure by listening to people. And if you listen to people, they will tell you They'll tell you amazing things if you listen to them, and many of those things are little tools that you can put in your toolkit, like Batman, and then you can go out into the world and use those tools, and you don't have to fall blindly into a pit quite as often. And so the humility element is, well, do you want to be right, or do you want to be learning? And, and, and it's deeper than that. It's, do you want to be the, the tyrannical king who's already got everything figured out, or do you want to be the continually transforming hero, or fool for that matter, who's getting better all the time? And that's actually a choice, you know. Um, it's a deep choice, and it's better to be the self-transforming fool who's humble enough to make friends with what he or she doesn't know, and to listen when people talk. And listening is a transformative exercise. Like if, if you listen to the people in your life, for example, if you actually listen to them, They'll tell you what's wrong with them, and how to fix it, and what they want. They can't even help it if you start listening, because people are so shocked if you actually listen to them, that they, they tell you all sorts of things that they might not have even intended to, things they don't even know. And then you can, you can work with that. And the other thing that's so interesting, you know, now and then you have a meaningful conversation, right? You have a good conversation with somebody, you walk away and you think, geez, you know what? We really connected, and I know more than I did when I came away from that conversation. And during the conversation, you're really engrossed in it. And that feeling of being engrossed is a feeling of meaning. And the feeling of meaning is engendered because you're having a transformative conversation. So your brain produces that feeling of meaning for you. It says, oh yeah, this is exactly where you should be, right here and now. It's, it's the right place and time for you. And that's a great place to occupy and so a good conversation where people are listening has exactly that nature and the reason it has that nature is because it is in fact transformative it's one of the truisms of, of clinical psychology like if you're a clinical psychologist a huge part of what you do is just listen to people it's like you know they come in they're unhappy and they'd rather not be something like that you say well why do you think you might be unhappy and they don't know, they have some ideas, and they may have to ramble around for like a year before they figure out why they're unhappy. They get rid of a bunch of reasons why they thought they were unhappy that are untrue, and then you kind of get to the heart of the problem. And Then you might ask them, well, if you could have what you wanted so that your life would be okay, what would that look like? And then they have to ramble around a bunch about that because they don't really know, but the listening will straighten them out because people think by talking. And in order to think, you have to have someone to listen, because it's very hard to think. Hardly anyone can think. And even the people who can think can only think about a limited number of things. But almost everybody can talk. And you can listen to yourself talk, and if someone listens to you, then, well then, you also have a foil for your thoughts, right? Because you can watch the person when you're talking and see if you're boring or see if you're amusing or if you're engrossing all of those things. And so like if you're arguing with your wife, let's say, or your husband, big party is going to want to win. That's stupid, because because you don't want that. You want to you want to defeat your wife in an argument. Oh well, great. Like if she was going to disappear tomorrow, no problem. But like you're going to like live with defeated, miserable her for the next week. That's no good. 
So you listen and you think, okay, well, here's, here's what, you, what I think you said. And maybe you even make it a little stronger and more elaborated than was the case with the original utterance so that you get the damn argument right. Because you don't want to win. You want to fix the problem. That's the winning. How do I decide if my inner voice is healthy or not? And how do I maintain it healthily? How can one tell if one's inner voice, judgment or conscience is a healthy one and not a voice that is the result of an unhealthy mind due to past experiences? Now, that's a really interesting question. It's the question of conscience. I continually ask my, frequently, let's say, or yearly, ask my personality class attendees if they heard the voice of conscience, if they had a feeling, an emotion, emotional state, let's say, or a voice that informed them when they had done something ethically wrong and that perhaps made them guilty as a consequence. And it was essentially a universal experience. And that's the voice of society within, I suppose. That's one way of thinking about it. The Freudians would think about that as the voice of the superego. Jung, Carl Jung, would take that conceptualization somewhat farther. He would have considered it the voice of the self, which is in part the voice of the ethic that's derived from the broader community insofar as that ethic is valid, let's say, but also in part the voice of the more thoroughly developed self that's still striving to be born. One thing you could say is that you, you experience violations of your conscience when you're not acting like the better person that you could possibly become. And so, to some degree, that's your higher self upbraiding you for failure to develop in the appropriate direction. And that seems to me to be a reasonable way of conceptualizing it. Now, the one question might be, how error-prone is your conscience, given that you're not omniscient? You have to attend to your guilt and your self-disgust and your self-contempt and your self-consciousness. You have to understand that the manifestation of those emotions might well indicate a moral failing on your part or a, a, a lack that needs to be addressed, while at the same time considering that it is not a straightforward matter to deal fairly with yourself and you can be too tormented by your conscience, too rigid, too responsible, take on too much weight onto yourself, deny yourself in a manner that isn't sustainable and so forth that, that a moral code, a moral way of being can become too rigid and, and inflexible and despite its putative aim upward be something counterproductive. I think most of the way out of that, if there is one, is well, careful thinking. You have to see what your conscience says. You have to see how you respond. You have to capture that voice and your responses, and, and you have to think it through. But most of that is done in dialogue with other people rather than as the consequence of internal thought. You know, if you have a dispute with your wife or your husband, your intimate partner, sibling, your parents, anybody close to you, and it's useful to, for each of you in the dispute to ask yourself and the other person very seriously, if you're at fault or if they're at fault, and, and for both of you to be able to contemplate that you might be at fault and so might the other person and that it's in your best interest to sort out exactly who's made the error and where and maybe it's both of you and maybe at different levels of analysis. Um, I think the same might be said about your reaction to your conscience. It's not uncommon for me to talk to my wife, my kids, my parents, my friends for that matter about something I might be feeling. Maybe I'm guilty about something. I'm self-conscious about something. I'm angry about something. Um, 
I feel impelled by my conscience to do something as a consequence, to change something. It's very helpful to discuss such things with other people, to say, look, here's what I think I did wrong and here's how I'm punishing myself, but I'm not sure that I'm not doing it in an exaggerated way. And you gather other people's opinions and listen to them carefully. And friends are extraordinarily useful in that regard. And that can help you calibrate it. So I think most of what we do to decide if our inner voice is healthy is discuss it with other people. And I believe, as I pointed out in my last book, uh, explicitly that a tremendous amount of our sanity is maintained as a consequence of social interaction. So you can't find your authentic self merely as a consequence of a journey within, I would say. You, you're not, there's just not enough of you. you. You have to be informed by the broader social world. What is the best way to avoid falling back into nihilistic behaviors and thinking? Well, a large part of that, I would say, is, is habit. The, the maintenance, the development maintenance of good practices, habits. If you find yourself dissolute, uh, Neurotic. If your tenants, if your thought tends in the nihilistic direction, and you tend to fall apart, organizing your life across multiple dimensions is a good antidote. It's not exactly thinking. Do you have an intimate relationship? If not, well, probably you could use one. Do you have contact with close family members, siblings, or children, or parents? Or, or, or people who are even more distantly related. If not, you probably need that. Do you see your friends a couple of times a week and do something social with them? Uh, do you have a way of productively using your time outside of employment? Are you employed? Do you have a good job or at least a job that is practically sufficient and that enables you to work with people who you like working with? Even if the job itself is you know, mundane or repetitive or difficult, sometimes the relationships that you establish with it in an in a employment situation like that can make the job worthwhile. Um, have you regulated your response to temptations, pornography, alcohol abuse, drug abuse? Is that under control? Um, I would say differentiate the problem. There's multiple dimensions of attainment, ambition, pleasure, responsibility, all of that, that make up a life. And to the degree that it's possible, you want to optimize your functioning on as many of those dimensions as possible. Those are all the questions that I would decompose the problem into the best way to avoid falling back into nihilistic behaviors and thinking. How can responsibility be differentiated from imposed guilt? Well, I think you adopt genuine responsibility, let's say healthy responsibility. I think you adopt that more or less voluntarily. I mean, there's an element of necessity and compulsion in our lives as well, because there are things we have to do to survive. But if you've explicitly formulated a set of goals and you're pursuing them, then you've adopted the responsibility to act in a certain manner to make those goals realize themselves. That's, that's responsibility that you've adopted rather than responsibility that's been imposed on you, assuming that you've thought through the goals and you find your spirit in harmony with those goals. Um, you can consult your resentment. I think that's a very useful step. If you find yourself angry and bitter about the things that you are responsible for doing, then that's an indication that you might be operating under some unhealthy compulsion, that you're rebelling, and that's the reason for the resentment against the insistence that you act in a certain way. Although it's also possible that you're just immature and that you're rebelling against the discipline that's necessary to attain the goals that you genuinely do want to attain and that are valid and that you are actively engaged in constructing. So 
you have to get that straight and some of that's a consequence of thought and again some of that's a consequence of of discussion with other people with whom you're intimate enough to have a conversation like that and perhaps they have conversations about similar things with you if you're fortunate human beings have built a mechanism let's say that's like a game engine you know how there are game engines now that people have devised their computational devices and you can take a game engine and you can generate games with it like computer games so the game engine is a mechanism for producing games well that's what our brains are like our brains are game engines for producing games and so what happens is that, that when you think you produce an avatar of yourself you produce a fictional world in, that that avatar inhabits and maybe you produce multiple fictional worlds and multiple avatars that's the you that could be tomorrow which is what you're doing when you're planning and you walk the avatar through its potential roots and those that look good you keep and those that don't look good you kill and so then you can embody the ideas that you keep and act those out and hopefully the idea is that when you embody them you're successful and you don't get killed don't have one plan right if you're going to stake yourself on something you should throw a couple of alternative scaffolds up beside you so that you have somewhere to go you want to be a doctor okay well you could be a nurse it's like it's not a doctor but it beats cutting your throat you're still doing 80% of what you wanted to do so you want to and you want to think about this during your whole life man if you're going to take a high risk you want to scaffold yourself in other areas so that if it fails you bottom doesn't drop out and you die and it's also very much worth thinking about with regards to setting up your life in general it's like if you concentrate solely on your career you can get a long way in your career and I would say that that's a strategy that a minority of men preferentially do that that's all they do they work like 70 80 hours a week they go flat out on their career they're staking everything on the small probability of exceptional status in a narrow domain but it's, it's hard on them. They don't have a life. It's very difficult for them to have a family. They don't know how to take any leisure activity, like they get very one dimension. Now, it may be that that unidimensionality is the price you have to pay to be exceptional at one thing, right? Because if you're gonna be something like a genius level mathematician or a scientist, say, it's like you're in your lab, you're in your lab all the time, you're working 70 hours a week or 80 hours a week, you're smart, you're dedicated, you're unidimensional, and that's how you get to beat all the other people who are doing that. It's the only way. But the problem is you don't get a life. Now, if you love being a scientist and you have that kind of focus of mind, well, first of all, you're a rare person, and second, you're gonna pay for it. But fine, more power to you. But, but it's, a, it's a risky business to do that. You sacrifice a lot for it. You know, and I would say most often, if you're speaking about having a healthy life, that isn't what you do. You spread yourself out more. So, you know, you have a family, you have some things that you do outside of work that are meaningful to you and useful. You, you have a network of friends. Well, that, that, those three things alone are, four things alone are plenty to keep you well oriented. And then if one of those things collapses, you know, everything doesn't go. Now, the, the price you pay for that is, the more you strive to optimize that balance, the less likely you are to be fantastically successful at any single one of them. But you might have a very, you know, if you consider your life as a whole, that might be a winning strategy. One of the things Carl Jung said, I really liked this. He thought that men went after perfection and women went after wholeness. So perfection would be stake it all on one thing and, and look for radical success. Not, all, not that all men do that, because they don't, but we're, we're talking about extremes, at, at least with the, regards to the men that do that. The wholeness idea is more like, well, I want, it's like I want one thing in my life to be 150%, or I want five things in my life to be 80%. Well, there, there's a lot more richness in a life where you have five things operating at 80%, but you're not operating at any of them at 150%. And I really believe this because I've watched men and women go through their careers now for a long period of time. And, but one of the things that I've noticed is that mostly women in their 30s bail out of unidimensional careers. They won't do them. They won't. 
put in the 80 hours a week that they would have to put in in order to dominate that particular area. And it isn't, the reason that they won't do it is because they decide it's not worth it. And no wonder, because why would that be worth it? You, you have to ask yourself that. It's like, well, you want to be an outstanding scientist. It's like, okay, really, really, that's what you want. Because that means that's what you do. Because you're competing with other people, you know, they're smart, they're hardworking. And if you want to be at the top, you have to be smarter and work harder than any of them. And working hard means working long hours. I mean, it also means working diligently, but in, in the final analysis, it's all, also an additive issue. If I'm smart and hardworking and I can crank out for 70 hours a week and you do it for 30, it's like in two years, I'm so far ahead of you, you will never, ever catch up. And I think partly maybe part of the reason, too, that women are oriented that way more than men. I think there's two reasons. One is socioeconomic status does not make women more attractive on the mating market, but it does make men more attractive. And the second is women's time frame is compressed. Right, because guys can always say, well, I'll have kids later. And they can say that till they're like 80. Whereas women, it's like, no way, man, you gotta get it, you gotta get it together by the time you're, let's say 40, but really probably by 35, but definitely by 40, because otherwise it ain't happening. And that's bloody dreadful. There's a sacrificial element in maturation, right? You have to sacrifice the pluripotentiality of childhood for the actuality of a frame. And the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, one reason is, it happens to you whether you do it or not. You can either choose your damn limitation, or you can let it take you unaware when you're 30, or even worse, when you're 40. And then that is not a happy day. You see, I see people like this, and I think it's more and more common in our culture, because people can put off mat maturity without suffering an immediate penalty. But all that happens is the penalty accrues and then when it finally hits, it just wallops you because when you're 25, you can be an idiot. It's no problem. Even when you're out in a job search, it's like, well, you don't have any experience and you're kind of clueless. It's yeah, yeah, you're young. You know, it's no problem. We can, that's what young people are like, but they're full of potential. Okay, well, now you're the same person at 30. It's like people aren't so thrilled about you at that point. It's like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, I'm just as clueless as I was when I was 22. It's yeah, but you're not 22. You're an old infant, right? And that's an ugly thing, an old infant. So the, the re part of the reason you choose your damn sacrifice because the sacrifice is inevitable, but at least you get to choose it. And then there's something that's, that's even more complex than that in some sense is that the problem with being a child is that all you are is potential and it's really low resolution. You could be anything, but you're not anything. So then you go and you adopt an apprenticeship, roughly speaking, and then you become, at least you become something. And when you're something, that makes the world open up to you again. You know, like if you're a really good plumber, then you end up being far more than a plumber. You know, if you're a really good plumber, well then you have some employees, you run a business, you train some other people, you enlarge their lives, you're kind of a pillar of the community, you, you have your family. It's once you pass through that narrow training period, which narrows you and constricts you and develops you at the same time, then you can come out the other end with a bunch of new possibility at half. Part of the proper path of development in the last half of life was to rediscover the child that you left behind as you were apprenticing. And so then you get to be something and regain that potential at the same time. You're in the situation that you're in right now and that's not good enough. And so that's another thing that's kind of interesting about people is they're chronically dissatisfied with the way things are. Well, that's okay because you wouldn't be motivated to move forward if you weren't chronically dissatisfied with the way that things are. But it's kind of annoying, you know, because you might think, well, why aren't you just happy with what you have? And the answer to that is generally because I don't know if it's going to last. And so that's part of it. And the other is, well, if the situation shifted a bit, maybe I'd have more options and some of that would be it would last longer, it'd be more stable, it'd be more promising. And so you can say, well, you should be satisfied with what you have, but it's kind of really a stupid thing in some sense to tell human beings because no matter what you have, it isn't going to solve your fundamental problem. So the problem isn't going away and you can't just fool yourself into saying, well, what I have is great. You could say, I could have a hell of a lot less, 
and that would be bad, and most people have a lot less than me, and I should be grateful for what I have, that's fine, that's perfectly reasonable, but you're stuck with this chronic sense of unfinished business, and the reason for that is, well, you're permanently vulnerable, so how, how could it be otherwise? And even if you've got your problem solved, then there's three or four people in your family that by no means have got their problems solved, so the problem of problems never goes away. That's a good thing to know existentially, too, because it helps you calibrate your life properly. Because you might be thinking, well, if I just got everything together, you know, I'd hit some plateau of satiation and stability, and, and then I would just be there. It's like, no, that's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. So you might as well just forget about that. Well, maybe you want to push your damn rock up a hill. You know, it's going to roll down again. It's like, what are you going to do? Just sit there by the rock? It's okay to be active, even, even if the problem you're trying to solve is not fundamentally solvable. That doesn't mean it isn't worth trying to solve. And you, you guys should listen to this, because I know what I'm talking about. If you happen to be creative, if you're a songwriter, or another kind of musician, or an artist, or, or, or any of the other number of things that you might be, find a way to make money, and then practice your craft on the side, because you'll starve to death otherwise. Now, some, for some of you, that won't be true, but it's a tiny minority. Your best bet is to find a job that will keep body and soul together and parse off some time that you can pursue your creative thing, because then, well, as a long-term strategy, a medium to long-term strategy, it's a better one. You know, you hear very frequently people say things like, everyone's creative. It's like, that's wrong, okay? It's wrong. It's just as wrong as saying that everyone's extroverted. First of all, you have to be pretty damn smart to be creative, because otherwise you're just going to get to where other people have already got, and that's not creative by definition. So, so being fast and being out there at the front of things really makes a difference. And then you also have to have these divergent thinking capabilities, and that's part of your trait structure. And creative people are really different than non-creative people. You know, partly because, for example, they're highly motivated to do creative things and to experience novelty and, and to chase down aesthetic experiences and to attend movies and to read fiction and to go to museums and to enjoy poetry and, and, and to enjoy music that's not conventional music, for example. These aren't trivial differences. And so it's a real, it's a real misstatement to make the proposition that everyone's creative. It's just simply not the case. It's a matter of wishful thinking. It's like saying that everyone's intelligent. It's like, well, if everyone's intelligent, then the, the term loses all of its meaning. Because any term that you can apply to every member of a category has absolutely no meaning. You know, the other thing you want to be thinking about here is that don't be thinking that creativity is such a good thing. It's a high-risk, high-return strategy. There's creative people in this room, man. You guys are going to have a hell of a time monetizing your creativity. It's virtually impossible. It's really, really difficult because, first of all, let's say you make an original product. You think the world will beat a pathway to your door if you build a better mousetrap. It's like, that's complete rubbish. It isn't, it, it isn't true in the least. If you make a good creative product, you've probably solved about 5% of your problem. Because then you have marketing, which is insanely difficult, and then you have sales, and then you have customer support, and then you have to build an organization. And you have to, if it's really novel, you have to tell people what the hell the thing is. You know, we built this future authoring program, right? It's available for people online. So how do you market that? No one knows what that is, and that's a real problem. If you write a book, well, then you have the problem that another million people have also written a book. But if you produce something that's completely new and doesn't have a category, people can't search for it online. How are they going to find it? And then you have pricing problems, and it's really unbelievably difficult to produce something creative and then monetize it. And even worse, if you're the creative person, let's say you have a spectacular invention. You've got no money, right? You've got no customers. Th those are big problems. And so maybe you go and you find a venture capitalist. We start with family and friends, because that's how it works. You raise money for your product. You raise money from your family and friends. That's assuming you have family and friends that have some money and that they're going to give it to you. And most people aren't in that situation. So it's a terrible barrier right off the bat. And then, of course, you're putting your family and friends at substantial financial risk, because the probability that your stupid idea is going to make money is virtually zero, even if it's a really brilliant idea. And so then let's say, well, you get past family and friends and you get venture capital, capitalists involved, because that's often the next step, or an angel investor. That's, there's, there's steps in building a business. Family and friends, angel investor, that's some rich guy that you've happened to meet, some manner, some way, who's, who's into this sort of thing and is willing to provide you with some money to get your product off the ground. Well, how much of your product is that person going to take? Well, most of it. 
Most of it. And no wonder, because, you know, you don't have any money. How are you going to bargain for control over your product? He'll just say, well, do you want the money or not? And if your answer is no, then he'll go and do something else with his money. It's not like there's no shortage of things that you can do with your money. There's a million things you can do with it. So you're not in a great bargaining position. And then if you get venture capitalists involved, they'll take another big chunk. And maybe if they're not very straight with you, they'll just throw you out. Because maybe by that point in the company's development, you're nothing but a pain in the neck. Because what do you know about marketing and sales and customer service and building an organization and running a business? Like you don't have a clue. So why do they need you? So even if you're successful at generating a new idea and you put it into a business, the probability that you as the originator of the, of the idea are going to make some money from it is very, very low. So don't be thinking that creativity is such a, is something you would want to curse yourself with. Now, you know, it's not all bad because it, it opens up avenues of experience for creative people that aren't available to people who aren't creative. But it definitely is a high risk, high return strategy. You know, so the overwhelming probability is that you will fail. But a small proportion of creative people succeed spectacularly. And so it's like a lottery in some sense. You're probably going to lose. But if you don't lose, you could win big. And that keeps a lot of creative people going. But also they don't really have much choice in it. Because if you're a creative person, you're like a, a, a fruit tree that's, that's bearing fruit. So you don't really have, you can suppress it, but it's very bad for you. You know, the creative people I've worked with is if they're not creative, they're miserable, so they have to do it. But, and, and you know, there's real joy and, and pleasure in it and, and psychological utility, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's an intelligent, it's certainly not a conservative strategy for moving forward through life. What does it mean to think creatively? It's something like this. You imagine that I tossed you out an idea and there's some probability that when I toss you that idea that that will trigger off other ideas in your imagination. So you can think about it as a threshold issue. If you're not very creative, I'll throw you an idea and hardly any other ideas will be triggered. And the ones that will be triggered are going to be very closely associated with that initial idea. So let's say I tossed each of you an idea and I asked you to think, tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, so what we would see first is that the first thing that comes to mind, in, like, in all likelihood, would be shared by many of you. Okay, so then you can think about that as a common response, right? And so that's a less creative response. And then there'll be some things that come to mind for you that are, that are so idiosyncratic that you're the only person that thinks it and no one can understand it. Well, that, that's also not exactly creative because the thing that you, for something to be creative, it has to be novel and useful at the same time. That's sort of a rough definition, creative something creative is novel and useful so you anyway so you can think of you, you get thrown an idea and there's some probability that that will co-activate other ideas and if it co-activates many other ideas that's like fluency and if it co-activates ideas that are quite distant from the original idea something like that and you could you could track distance by comparing it to to probability that other people have generated it then that's also another indication of creativity so they have to be unlikely, many unlikely responses that are useful. That's what creativity is, roughly speaking. And then you can fractionate it into different dimensions. So that's creative thinking. But then creative achievement would be the ability to take those original ideas and then actually to implement them in the world. And that's obviously much more different than merely being creative. Imagine what happens when you play Monopoly. What happens? Everybody has the same amount of money to begin with, right? So then you start playing. It's basically a random game. Well, some people start to win a bit and some people start to lose a bit. And then if you win, the probability that you'll keep winning starts to increase. And if you lose, your vulnerability increases as you lose. And then maybe you've got, say, six people playing Monopoly. Soon one person has zero. What happens when they have zero? They're out of the game. So zero is a weird number because when you hit zero, you're out of the game. So, so then if you keep playing, people start to stack up at zero, right? What happens at the end of the game? One person has all the property and all the money and everyone else has none. Right, that, that's what happens if you play an iterated trading game to its final conclusion. It's not a consequence necessarily of structural inequality. It's built into the system at a deeper level than that. So, you know, people talk about all the time about how unfair it is that 1% of the population has the vast amount of the money and 1% of the 1% has most of that money and 1% of the 1% of the 1% has most of that money. It's, a, it's an inevitable conclusion of iterated trading games, and we don't know how to fight it. 
We don't know how to take from the people who have and move it to the bottom without it instantly moving back up to the top. Different people maybe, but still back up to the top. Because even the 1% churns a lot. Like I think you have a 10% chance, if I remember correctly, you have a 10% chance of being in the top 1% for at least one year of your life and a 40% chance of being in the top 10% for at least one year in your life. That's in Canada and the US, it's less so in Europe. So there's a fair bit of churning at the top end. It's not the same people all the time who have the money, but it is a tiny fraction of the people all the time who have all the money.